talk about, one of which was to give you a talk on um, Einstein's phrase, um, aber bushaft ist er nicht. But in the end, it was easier for me to develop this idea. So I'm giving a talk about the quantum theory of open systems, and I'm summarizing how new theory emerges from non-self-adjoint quantum physics. Non-self-adjoint. That's to say that the Hamiltonian is not a mission. It doesn't have real eigenvalues. So it's obvious that something's going to happen. So here is a general overview of the whole thing. I'm going to talk just briefly about conventional quantum theory um, and remind you how it developed. Uh, our own reality, we usually measure in real numbers. The question is, is that really appropriate? Should we just be measuring real numbers? But von Neumann defined um, quantum theory so that you would only get real numbers out of it. That's what he, he, he sort of uh, didn't say, but that's what he did. So quantum theory itself is complex valued. We know that if you're not dealing with um, a, um, a, a electromagnetic wave equation, if you're dealing with a Schrodinger equation or a Pauli equation or anything like that, you're dealing with something which is complex valued. Yet we don't say usually that we're measuring complex values. Is that strictly right? When you look at the quantum theory of closed systems, you get a self-adjoint system and everything comes out with real eigenvalues and von Neumann is happy. Real valued eigenvalues agrees with the way we teach our students to think about reality. We live in a real world, do we? My Indian friends don't quite think so. We live in something much more imaginative. I didn't say imaginative. Um, open systems, turns out they cannot be self-adjoint. And what I'm going to tell you is that therefore their eigenvalues aren't just real eigenvalues. They are complex eigenvalues. And um, I've actually missed out a point here, which I've added. But the conclusion is that the non-self-adjoint quantum theory is more general than ordinary quantum theory and it tells us a bit more about reality. Whether you think it's comfortable or not, or whether it's true or not, is another question. But I think it's directing us to something interesting, new, and since that's usually what these, uh, these particular conferences are all about, I hope I can give you a bit of enjoyment. And me too. Okay, so let's look at this. Quantum theory, I hardly need to remind you of its origin. I didn't put down the Bohr model of the atom and, and things like uh, de Broglie's hypothesis. But we start with matrix mechanics, Schrodinger's equation, uh, uh, remembering that he actually tried to solve the Klein-Gordon equation before he did solve the Schrodinger equation. He got the wrong fine structure constant and abandoned the Klein-Gordon equation. And it wasn't until Dirac developed his equation out of the Pauli equation that we got the correct fine structure constant out of um, ordinary quantum, well, relativistic quantum mechanics. Wave functions are complex valued. Time remains a real variable. This is quantum theory. Is this restriction valid? Well, it's obviously useful, it keeps us comfortable. We don't have to say strange things to our students at first year, second year college, but um, I want to tell you, I think we might tell them other things. So, let's move on to part two, section two. Our reality measures real numbers. We measure real lengths, we measure time with a real variable, yet in quantum theory, our wave functions are complex values. Why? Well, um, are, are other values, variables, not complex valued? Why not? This is the basic question. 
And I think I've got a second slide, if I remember it rightly, in this particular section. If not, I'll come back to it. I've done something awful. No, let's come back again. All right? Um, so let's just see. A possible answer. Quantum theory of closed systems, as I said to you, is self-adjunct. That's to say that it uses Hermitian Hamiltonians. The Hermitian Hamiltonians have real eigenvalues. The energies are real. Uh, they deal with a, um, a real time variable. You can't go wandering around a complex plane in time. You go straight along the real axis, as it were, remembering that if you write down dispersion relations, later in quantum field theory and other things they do in, in elementary particle physics, you begin to assume that time is actually a complex variable. So, um, although we're dealing with things at this level which are safe, other people have done much more um, delicate dances later down the quantum physics line. But real valued eigenvalues agree with what we call reality. After all, our, um, <coughs> our, our clocks, we, uh, watches we wear on the wrist, the, the hands go around the clock, but it's not an argon diagram they're going around. It's a real a repeating thing which repeats every 12 or 24 hours or whatever we like. And time is a linear variable with a real value. Oh, sorry, I've done it again. I have to not push the one on the screen. Now, in quantum field theory and elementary particle physics, quantum fields interact with quantum fields. Phases are measured. We know that phases are measured in, um, in uh, uh, interference patterns. Psi is are represented in argand diagrams. Complex values, numbers, are measured. So I repeat the question. Was von Neumann too restrictive? Move on to section four, part one. I think there are three parts to section four. Open systems cannot be self-adjunct. Why not? Because if you have an open system, matter can flow out of them. They can lose energy. Energy is not conserved. The amount of matter is not conserved. Your normalized wave function begins to decrease. I'll give you another example. The simplest example, a decaying particle is said to have a complex energy. Why? Because it has a real part and an imaginary part, and the imaginary component relates to the half-life. If I have a stable particle, then it has a real eigenvalue. But immediately I have to get rid of that wave function. The e to the minus iet has got to have a negative e to the minus et component in it, so that the magnitude of the wave function decreases in value. I'm just saying very simple things. Basically, we all know them. So um, the imaginary part of the energy is related to the, um, the half-life tor. And if the half-life tor is infinite, your imaginary component is zero. And the quicker it decays, polonium-208 rather than uranium-238, then you get something which is um, different. You get an energy for your radioactive um, isotope, which has got an imaginary component in its energy. So the psi decreases, the system is no longer normalized.
Yes, that's right. I'll be done if I find out if you want to be No, no, it's fine. I'm very happy to take it. It's all right. Our, our officially designated speaker just arrived. Let's give him a hand. His train was on fire. He came from Singapore. He has a better story. I thought I had a good story, but his is better. Come, uh, he's come even further than I have. I'm only from Bangalore. So. <laughs> and we could all make all of being in a pickle jokes we want, because, you know, but he's probably heard them all his life, so it doesn't mean anything to him. No, it's really, I, yesterday, Daniel did quite right. I was yesterday evening coming from Singapore. I started at 6 this morning, but maybe I've heard in Germany there was, according to the dry uh, season, a fire between Cologne and Bonn. And they closed all trains. All. And then two hours ago in Aachen, I was um, calling the person, please let the train wait. But the woman ignored it. And for that reason, I stayed two hours and a half. It was, I apologize. No apologies necessary. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So um, with the decaying particle, the magnitude of the wave function decreases. You no longer have a conserved up psi squared. Born's conservation of probability is no longer valid. And you get all these changes taking place which are because you're dealing with a decaying system, which is a, an open system, because any system which decays is an open system. So this is a, an example that we're all familiar with, and we see that the emission quantum theory, not the self-agile quantum theory, breaks down. Now, so the open systems don't obey self-agile physics, um, they're usually mixtures of particles, so you describe them by density operators, which I've written density matrices, which I've written with that nice conventional little row, and it's an open system, so I put it in green. And uh, the IHD by T, T, with a real T, is now an inadmissible operator. And I haven't explained this very well in this slide. You have IHD by DT, and it's probably an H slash, which I couldn't find. Um, it is a nice Hermitian operator. The right-hand side has usually got an IHD by DT with a double arrow over it acting on the row, which means it acts on one part way to the left and the other way to the right, sorry, that's my thinking of it, uh, one way to the right and the other way to the left. And it's a much more complicated equation. It's very nasty to write down, uh, really. And you have a non-self-adjunct Hamiltonian on the left-hand side. And uh, we had a a, a, a big conference, a summer school for two weeks at our university back in 2011, where George Sudarshan came because he was a great friend of the um, the um, the uh, chancellor, vice chancellor then, and I said to him, "This whole thing is 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 inconsistent." He said, "Yes, but I can't. I'll say this again later. I can't solve the equation." unless I write down the Hermitian operator. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to write down the non-Hermitian operator. And I said to him, but I think you're missing something. I'm going to show you what he was missing. <laughs> so um, um, if you write down a time variable, which is complex, then instead of staying along the real axis, it's going to be able to go this way or that way. Right? So it's no longer going to follow a real trajectory. So my point is that if you write down the correct equation, which changes this from being a, a self-adjoint operator to a non-self-adjoint operator, you then have to allow the time trajectory to waver along and do, do its own thing in the complex plane. It's not going to go round in a circle because it's got to increase in time. Um, so, the team must follow a complex valued trajectory. 
I can't solve that equation. I'm not going to pretend to. But I'm going to try and tell you one or two interesting things about it. Time's imaginary component must change as time increases. The admissible operator is D, I've now written it in red, so you can see there's danger looming, where T is complex. What does the imaginary T represent? Huh? I mean, I'm really going to limit my talk today, uh, uh, conveniently, because it's really uh, uh, pretty superficial. I'm going to limit myself to telling you this little thing, what I think it, 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 it represents. So this is the point. I'm summarizing. If IHD by DT, where T is complex, is the correct operator and follows a complex trajectory, what could the imaginary component of T represent? Okay, it turns out that T imaginary has to fit in to quantum statistical mechanics. Now, quantum statistical mechanics contains a term to do with the temperature, quantum statistical thermodynamics. And it tells you essentially that if you have a high temperature, you're going to have less of the, uh, the thing. So um, I have actually added an extra I by mistake there. I think that I shouldn't be there. Because when you have quantum statistical mechanics, we know that when we do statistical mechanics, you actually get a term which is e to the minus e over kt as the, um, uh, 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 as the uh, fraction of, um, of each, or the probability that each state is filled. Have I said that right, or if I, can someone say it better for me? I haven't thought it through in de enough detail today, okay? So, we know that you get e to the minus e over kt, where I've written beta as one over kt, as a normal content of your physics equations, in quantum statistical mechanics. So what I'm going to propose to you is that what you're doing in your um, non-hermitian quantum theory, non-self-adjunct quantum theory, I was very severely um, chastised by George Sudarshan for saying it was non-hermitian. He said, you must call it non-self-adjunct, which as I've, I've tried to be so um, uh, conscientious to call it that all the way through this this talk but when you do it and you see that you have a decaying system it relates to the half-life in uh, in the way I showed you on the previous slide it relates in quantum statistical mechanics to the decrease in occupancy of each energy level as you increase in energy so what I'm proposing, and I'm really not justifying it adequately today, is that the equations, oh, come on. The equations include a thermodynamic content because when you look at quantum systems in thermodynamic equilibrium, there is no exchange of anything between them. If you have a quantum system which is effectively in thermodynamic equilibrium with a surrounding um, thermodynamic uh, cavity, it's effectively in equilibrium as a closed system. In classical physics, you write down a principle of detailed balance. And you see that the whole thing is exchanging real particles the whole time, because that's the way we think about it. But we know in quantum physics that if you don't measure it, you can't really say that anything's happening. And if the two things are in equilibrium, you can't measure anything happening. And I would add that I have this rather um, singular 
thought about a lot of what we do in quantum theory is that no one ever takes into account the amount of information that you have to put in by arranging the thermodynamic conditions correctly to actually get a quantum uh, experiment on single particles going. Um, that's an entirely different question. But I do want to say this. The equations include thermodynamics because no exchange occurs between systems in equilibrium. There's no principle of detailed balance. Open systems are out of equilibrium with their surroundings. They can't be open systems unless they are out of equilibrium with their surroundings. So the inclusion of thermodynamics is self-consistent. Now, the Sudarshan's objection, I repeat, the non-self-adjoint equation can't be solved. My point, better to write down the correct equation. Doing so enables us to identify completely new physics. You know, if you go, you go to string theory and things, you can begin to see time as a kind of complex variable. But when we're doing ordinary quantum mechanics, you always think of time as a real variable go to open systems, which we never do, and it seems that time has to be treated as a complex variable, and um, actually when you begin to do this, and I haven't, got to, I haven't prepared to tell you what happens when you go one or two more steps down the line, you get some very, as I remember it, beautiful further results. So writing down a non-self-adjoint equation introduces a completely new dimension to physics. Now, um, one can talk about Sudarshan's real value solution, because he was dealing with a, a real value time, and he could solve it. One can suggest that that real value solution is a first approximation, and it yields some kind of um, sort of, it's not actually real, but it's some kind of component corresponding to a real component of your density matrix. But to obtain the, the uh, other component of it, my suggestion is that we should use dispersion relations. And you might be able to generate, and I haven't tried this, but I do know systems uh, which are written down in um, Feynman's lectures, where he deals, if you remember Feynman's volume four, uh, volume three of Feynman's lectures, he deals with two systems which are interacting, which are exchanging energy, and he solves the two systems together. But formally, it's absolutely impossible to solve one of the systems without the other, because it's an open system, and the physics was never developed. So you have this strange situation where your two systems together, you can write down a nice equation and you get a beat frequency between them as they exchange energy, and you get a nice solution. But when you try and write down one at a time, you find that you would have to put in a temperature for that system, and it would oscillate between minus infinity and plus infinity. That's what actually happens. And you... Um, Feynman, nor anyone else, wrote down the, uh, the solutions. So, um, there are a few suggestions for you. Um, well, I've reached the conclusion. Non-self-adjoint quantum theory is more general than quantum theory. I feel it tells us more about reality. Time is probably I'm going to say probably and qualified, really a complex variable. Its imaginary component concerns the temperature T of the quantum system, and it may be possible to obtain solutions for the new equation. I think I managed to finish that with lots of time to spare, even time for some questions. Good. Give me a good kick in the butt. Yes. <laughs> First, uh, when you speak.
about uh, an open system of equilibrium, it would be better to, to speak about a stationary uh, state, uh, because uh, uh, in a stationary state, it's, it's an equilibrium, but you have exchange of matter and, and energy. Ah, Even in equilibrium. Ah, but I, if, if you say this, uh, okay, I try to meet this objection. Well, as I understand, you've just said that if we have two systems in equilibrium, there is an exchange of matter and energy yes. going on. In, open now, it, in quantum theory, if you don't also, if you don't observe something, does anything happen? Yeah. <laughs> Myself, I have two 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 oscillators in quantum one two system with two oscillators in equilibrium, and uh, they exchange each time uh, ah, energy. So in other words, you're talking about two coupled pendulums, if you like, like yes. um, and you can see that uh, they do exchange energy between them. Yes, yes, and it all this in, in equilibrium. Yes. Um, yes. But that's not exactly my understanding of it. Yes. My understanding is slightly different. Yes. But, but if I, I, I want to the say, the of Prigogine, who works on open systems. Ah, yeah, yes, yeah, but he yeah. wasn't a quantum theorist. George Pr Sudarshan and Prigogine came to a conference that I arranged in 1975, and uh, they liked each other so much that Prigogine began working at the University of Austin in Texas yeah, with yeah. Sudarshan. Yeah. Uh, and they, they did collaborate hugely, and, and uh, Prigogine's main books came out after that happy event. Yeah. Um, I can't claim credit for that, but... Um. <laughs> uh, you, you could be interested because I wrote a paper about uh, uh, physics with three times and three space. And you proposed two times, but uh, it's the same. Uh, uh, I will give you uh, some well, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that there are two times. Yes, the real imaginary, imaginary component. I, but it, it has actually to follow a trajectory Yes. So there's only one time, okay? Yes. Whereas if you take a group like SO42, yes. which is the conformal group, you do have a time with two real dimensions. And I've written papers on conformal time as well. But in the Schrodinger equation, when we write the imaginary number multiplied by D psi by ET, in fact, uh, the imaginary number has no, nothing to do with time. Absolutely. We're agreed on that, the yeah. Schrodinger equation. And uh, with yes. the imaginary number, you must take always the plus and minus, which makes that you have the future and the past. Absolutely. But now, this point I didn't yeah. make. Immediately you have a time trajectory which requires you to go one way up or the other way down in the imaginary plane. You've immediately broken time symmetry. Okay, so these open systems equations, which are about systems not in equilibrium, automatically break time symmetry. They do it consistently with the second law of thermodynamics, but they do it for completely different reasons. I should have produced a slide on that, but I've been badly writing it up in the last talk. But the quantum mechanics is well known uh, for reversible systems. Yes, for so for which is reversible. reversible. Yes, absolutely. Yes. But these are not reversible because the so trajectory. Yes, exactly. I think this is quite a, a possibly useful approach to irreversibility in the whole of mechanics, and it does link. Go on. Sorry, he was put his hand out first. Can I give another approach to, uh, to reversibility as well, which is to consider consider the asymmetry between time the which? The asymmetry between the spatial and the temporal dimensions in yes. reality as, as it stands. One way of looking at this um, is that is that if one takes a metric where one has a plus minus 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 metric, distances in space squaring to a negative number always and time to a positive number, then one can explain the asymmetry one has between these two by thinking about um, time um, by thinking about every distance that one observes being something which is absolutely a negative distance. So the distance between me and you at the moment is not two meters, but it's minus two meters when we're talking about a squared quantity. Yes. Everything is in a no-go. Now, if one then switches to spherical polar coordinates, 
in the real set. So one has a real set of x, y, z, but they're not x, y, z, they're i, x, i, y, and i, z, so one's considering something which is essentially squaring to a negative number. Then one has different kinds of solutions in time and space. One has forwards and backwards solutions in space, where one can go forwards and backwards because that element is oscillatory, and one can only have unidirectional ones out from oneself in, in, in the time dimension, and that gives an asymmetry between the two. Well, but in that sense, what it means is it means that we may think we live in the real world, but in fact we absolutely live in the imaginary world because the basis of <laughs> x is imaginary, y is imaginary, and z is imaginary. So Thank that was the you. point Thank I'd like to make. Um, um, one more. Uh, yes, yes. I'm just going to comment that the ordinary Schrodinger equation is a hyperbolic differential equation and therefore has oscillatory solutions, whereas the Parabolic differential equation as in case we yes, yes. have some of a hybrid. And uh, I'm, it occurs to me that a part of every uh, space, solution space, which is a Hilbert space, right, for the hy hyperbolic, if you take it away, then you don't have a complete set of solutions any longer. And it looks like somehow you're, you're filling it with a well, parabolic. When you and so if you get rid of, throw all the physics away and look at this from the point of view of uh, the structure of partial differential equations, you might see something interesting. Yes, but that's useful. true. But can, I just remind you that yeah. immediately you're dealing with density matrices. Yeah. You're not dealing with Hilbert spaces. You're dealing no. with what is called Banach spaces, and they're, mm -hmm. they're slightly different. The limit of every Banach space is a Hilbert space, but okay. it's... Yeah. They're not, they're not reciprocal. In a binary space, it has uh, both, both characters of solution? Yeah. Uh, and the binary space associated with the partial differential equation? Yes, yeah. It has oscillatory and and the case, well, well, or uh, exponential. I'm not prepared to. Yeah. to I'm not either, but I'm saying, so well, that's where it's all okay. pointing. Okay. Thank you very much.